if we defer something to February, the Caesar report, if we defer that to February, the problem is we don't know what else is going to be on the agenda for February. I'm kind of motivated to, to do it now. People are here. They're ready to talk. They have a presentation. Are you guys willing to work to potentially 6.30? Six. Let's say six. <laughs> oh, no. But then we have council-initiated okay, discussion. Right. Right. So it is. It just depends how talkative they are. There you go. <laughs> on the council initiated discussion, I agree, but not on the Caesar report. Okay, yes. let's forge on then. So um, I think the funding for the Caesar project has officially ended. Not surprisingly, the research has not. People are continuing to be productive. But because uh, the funding has ended, it seemed like an appropriate time to mark the end or the sunsetting of this particular research project. And we're fortunate to have on council two of the members of that consortium, and they're going to present the global findings of 10 years of CSER projects. So that's Gail and Kyle. Is Gail going first? OK. All right, so I um, want to take you back to 2011. It seems like yesterday to some of us. Um, but no ClinGen, very rarely did we get exomes or genomes clinically. There was no ACMG incidental finding list. There was no ACMG AMP, uh, how you classify a variant uh, guidance. Uh, things were very, very different. We didn't have good uh, standards of practice for anything. And so NHGRI um, funded the CSER phase one with really the goal of get the genome to the clinic or in reality the exome to the clinic and try and work out all the things that might come up. Okay, so let's see what slide we're on. Okay, um, so the, the goals are listed here. What are the best practices? Um, what kind of patients are best serves? How do you analyze these data? This is before there were very automated um, variant uh, annotation. We had sort of rougher ones, but not what we have now. Um, what do we give back to patients and how? Um, and you know, just what do we do with all these data? Um, so the first set of awards made were the U Awards. There were six of these. Um, there were partnered R awards. The U awards were multidisciplinary. They had embedded LC. They had genomics people, lab medicine, clinicians, genetic counselors. R was LC focused. And then there was a phase two that was funded a bit later that added some U awards. Of course, there was NHGRI uh, staff. Lesby Secker's ClinSeq group um, was swept in to uh, CSER 1, and there was a coordinating center added. And you can see along the bottom, there were a variety of uh, working groups, which we're familiar with from lots of our different consortia. Um, so we're trying to look for clinical utility um, in phase 1. Phase 2 was funded in 2017. Things were quite different by then, and so now we're looking at evidence generation as opposed to exploratory, so the E got switched out. Um, and that was much more um, focused on diverse populations. All of those awards were given to sites that proposed more than 60% diversity. And we'll show you later that they actually achieved about 75% diversity across the program in CSER 2. So the CSER 2 goals, I'm not going to read in detail, but again, was embedding LC along with clinical genomics. Um, these are the phase two sites. Uh, you can see the national map. The East Coast and the South are well represented. We've got the West Coast, uh, but we have a little bit of work in the middle there, um, but, not, but not a lot. Um, and again, a variety of working groups that are listed along the bottom. Um, ClinSeq, as I said, was swept in. Les was extremely helpful, having uh, started looking at genome, excuse me, exome sequences in a group of people, um, and he was very great contributor to the consortia. Um, all right, so starting at the beginning, we did generate a lot of tools and resources. Uh, all of the research materials were put up on the CSER website. They were very well used. 
The consent forms were requested all the time, um, templates for return of results. Um, over on the right, you see there was a guide to interpreting genomic reports that is a tool for non-geneticists to understand what's in a clinical report, and that was actually hosted on the ASHG website as well as the CSER website and now on Anvil. All of the resources that used to be on the CSER website have been migrated to Anvil at this time. All right. so. Um, this is the one place where I'm going to digress, and then I promise I'll be faster than this. But we had the very first CSER meeting, and someone made a comment that, well, we don't have to worry about incidental findings because they're just going to be so rare, we don't need to think about them. Right. Well, yeah, and the clinicians were like, what? Um, and there was some robust argument. And then I went back to Seattle, and we had a local team meeting. And I said, well, I'm just going to like write the theoretical paper where you say, like, this is 1 in 500, this is 1 in 300, I'm just going to add them all up and show them the math. And Debbie Nickerson said, uh, um, real people need real data, Gail. <laughs> So I said, well, if I had real data, and she said, well, use the exome variant server data, and so we did get permission from NHLBI to use that exome variant server data and generated the rate of incidental findings, um, and that's the first paper listed on the bottom there, Dorschner, we did it in 1,000 people, half European, half African ancestry, found a higher rate of incidental findings in European than African that was basically um, what was in a database versus what wasn't. Um, and we redid that with all 6,500 people in that database um, and with a lower rate um, in, in Europeans, although still a lower rate in, in African ancestries, because the second time we spent a lot more time on QC, because what we didn't understand, because this is pre-ClinVar, is that different people were classifying variants differently. So that, that surprised me as a clinical geneticist. It worried me a lot. Um, so we, what is shown here in this figure is that um, we took all of the P and LP variants that any reviewer read, and we had them blindly read by a second person. And the classifications were discordant half of the time. Um, and most of those, we ended up with a third-party senior adjudication group. Most of those were overread, so they really should have been read as VUSs, and they were read as PLP. And there's just this bias towards overinterpreting um, at that time. So we then got into the space of um, consistency across labs. There were nine labs in the original thing. We also, at looking at the prevalence, and I'm highlighting two fabulous junior people, Laura Amendola and Reagan Hart here. Um, Reagan looked at the rate of secondary findings, but in the context of family history, how those explain family history, and how modest the costs were to give people better genetics care. Um, so, as I said, we got interested in variant classification consistency, and we did this bake off across the nine labs that were part of CSER. And this was just when um, the, the ACMG AMP guidelines came in for classifying variants, just at the same time. So we asked everyone, and I should say, prior to that, that committee had come and presented to CSER, and we had given them pretty robust feedback. And at least one very significant recommendation we made, they did pick up. So we even had a role in those guidelines as they were being formed. And Sue Richardson, who was the first author on the paper for the guidelines, was in CSER at that time, as was Heidi Riemann and probably a whole bunch of other people I should mention. In any case, um, so we said to each lab, classify it the way you're going to classify it in your lab. And then classify it the way you understand the ACMG new guidelines to work. And, and let's see if, it, if we get more consistent when we use those guidelines. And the two colors here, one is if we use the way we always do it, that's, we were concordant a third of the time. Now, that seems very low, but it's nine labs, and they all had to agree, OK? So if eight labs agreed, it wasn't concordant, but still not great. Um, uh, we did compare it at one point to like pathology slides just to make ourselves feel better. It turns out they're not that concordant across nine labs either. Um, but when we used the ACMG class, it didn't get any better. And what really happened is people just kind of used the ACMG guidelines that validated what they thought it should be. Um, and so we ended up having a lot of discussions about how to consistently 
use those classification guidelines. And we were lucky because we had people in the room who knew what the guidelines were supposed to be doing. And so when we were abusing them, um, they, they could help us to understand. So the paper not only described the rate of incidental findings and inconsistency in the reading, but had a lot of recommendations for more consistent use and clarification of those uh, lab guidelines. And that, I think, was a very, very important paper and contribution. OK, so we did um, several joint meetings with the Emerge Consortium. And one of them was this paper, which was an update of the prior Bookman Fabsitz papers on return of genomic research results to participants. Um, the floor of the ceiling, Wiley named it. She's so good at naming. Um, uh, the floor of the ceiling and, and choices in between, and came up with some newer principles. One was that there was no du duty to search for a genomic variant that was important to someone's health. But if you did come across it, it should be offered. But also that participants should be able to refuse that information unless it was key to the research project. If the research project was, what happens when I give you this result, then you shouldn't enroll people who don't want it. But if that wasn't the goal of the research, that people should be able to refuse that information. OK, and, and at the time, you may remember, ACMG was arguing about whether incidental findings should mandatorily be returned um, or not. OK, so here's, we're going to tag team a little. OK, so uh, as Gail said, um, CSER 1 was really, you know, we were asking very fundamental questions early on. And so this is just uh, intended to show that we had quite a bit of work on informed consent. And uh, this study by Barbara Bernhardt um, basically looked through um, folks who were obtaining informed consent and started to sort of try to uh, find what are the things that all of these folks are doing, how frequently do they bring it up, and try to get an idea for like what, what are the uh, elements that every informed consent could have from an empirical perspective. So uh, really great work. And then lots of other uh, great work on informed consent for pediatrics, et cetera. Um, we also looked at um, outcomes after um, returning results. Um, these are, um, uh, this is a paper by Jill Robinson. Again, the little pictures are show, highlighting when we have a junior investigator who was leading the study. This has been around so long, I was actually a, a junior investigator at the time that we started. So uh, as you can see, I've got this gray hair now. Um, uh, so anyway, we, we wanted to highlight uh, the role that Caesar played in developing the careers of these junior faculty. Um, so anyway, as you see those pictures, that's what you're, you're seeing there. Um, this paper was looking at outcomes on the factor and the micro, which are sort of um, measures that, that look at uh, both positive and negative experiences with receiving genomic results. And you can see here some of the results of that. OK, moving into the second phase of Caesar, E is for evidence generating. Um, starting in 2017. Um, we started out by harmonizing um, measures uh, for a number of um, uh, issues that are relevant to genomic medicine. And in some ways, this is, uh, you know, one of the most valuable resources, I think, out of all of CSER is just sort of starting to dig in and say, okay, assuming that we don't have uh, people who are willing to answer a thousand questions, what are the things that we really should be asking. And we started to turn up uh, questions that needed to be asked that had never been validated. And so we had several uh, sets of questions that we were uh, developed for CSER and, and validated through CSER and uh, have now gone on to be used in various resources such as Phoenix. And so um, really, I think something that every consortium really needs to do going forward is just Figure out what are the things we are, we're all going to measure. Um, as you can imagine, especially in CSER 2, participant inclusion and diversity was a major uh, topic of interest. Um, this framework is sort of looking at access to genomic medicine um, and access to clinical follow-up after receiving uh, genomic medicine results. And so uh, we, we have really excellent work here across a number of areas uh, looking at the, these issues. This study um, was looking at um, factors that influenced uh, participant understanding of their results, participant emotional responses, really thinking about inclusion and diversity and the way 
the uh, f uh, mechanisms of um, uh, inclusion and diversity kind of affect the way that genomic medicine is received and utilized by participants. So, um, and thinking about how we can compensate for that or adjust for that uh, in the way that we disclose results. Uh, also, stakeholder engagement was a central part, especially of CSER II. And before the very first meeting of CSER II, we uh, started off with a stakeholder engagement activity uh, before that meeting. And Julio Daniel re uh, reported on this, this work. OK, um, two slides here featuring um, Hadley uh, Smith, uh, Stephen Smith, who is uh, a, you know, a, a really excellent researcher, now a, a faculty member. And um, this, pro this study looked at perceived utility of participants and what the ways in which a genomic result was useful to them. And um, this is really important work, I think, because we're used to uh, doing sort of a dichotomized approach that you either have clinical utility, which sort of matters to certain stakeholders, like funders um, of, of healthcare, and then you've got sort of like the personal utility, which is all that other stuff. And this really helped to start dig in and say, what is all that other stuff? And you, you really start to see that the, these, this is not just sort of like good to know. It has all these practical implications in the real world that, that really matter. So I uh, personally use this work quite a bit in thinking about where should we be uh, looking to understand what the value of this information is to uh, patients and their families. Um, so this is, I re recommend everyone go to this article and look at the uh, video abstract. We have the picture here of it. Um, this is basically um, uh, work, work that, again, Hadley did, uh, looking for what clinicians, the recommendations that clinicians made, and then the changes that parents made in health or lifestyle changes, and, um, you know, how a positive uh, VUS or negative result sort of resu resulted in different kinds of recommendations and actions. Um, this underserved framework is uh, an idea that we had coming up in CSER th through the, um, the RFA essentially told us, hey, you need to be thinking about folks who are underserved um, and, and as a separate category from sort of underrepresented race and ethnicity. And so we really uh, needed to develop some idea of what are these different categories through which folks experience barriers to access and uh, how can we measure them and how can we standardize across the consortium folks measuring cutoffs for income or uh, insurance and sort of basically uh, trying to get everyone working in the, on the same kinds of standards so that our analyses sort of are correspond to one another. Uh, so this, this article is hopefully gonna be out soon. Um, this is work um, by Alice Popejoy in collaboration with ClinGen, and this is looking at um, how investigators um, use uh, measures of diversity in their personal work, and um, the, you start at the bottom going up. These are the, um, the types of categories that folks use more frequently or how they view why they, they use these measures of diversity. Um, and the, the top one, you can see disease prevalence in populations, and then also the geographic origin of patients and families. Next is you. So in, the, in CSER 2, we moved into uh, bake-off number two, and the idea was, well, five years have passed. Maybe we're getting better at this. We're used to using these ACMG guidelines. And um, we also looked at it um, by ancestry, white uh, um, European ancestry versus not European ancestry. And uh, you know, you can see in the slide, sorry, the pointer doesn't really work, but um, that we did have a better, we have 52% agreement instead of 33, but this is better, um, but you know, not perfect. Um, and, but it didn't differ by ancestry, so that was good news. Um, uh, but Interestingly, of the discordant variants, 21% um, of them would have had a clinical impact because they were either 
likely pathogenic versus VUS or pathogenic versus VUS. So again, still need to do better to be consistent across labs. And we, again, highlighted what were the reasons for discordances, how we could minimize discordances across labs. So just highlighting things had gotten better, but there was still work to do. And, and this is an experience we still have. Um, all right, so we did a lot of um, economic work, and some of the important work was uh, facing payers because they're important stakeholders in genomic medicine and frankly getting these tests paid for is a high priority for a lot of us who do uh, clinical genomics. And so we had papers looking at, you know, interviewing payers and trying to understand what their needs were um, and looking at cost effectiveness as well to provide evidence to support payment for genomic services. Um, the vast majority of papers that came out of CSER were site-specific. So they weren't all consortium or work group papers, but site-specific. 327 site-specific papers, um, so 84% of the U grant papers were site-specific. And here's just a couple of them, exome sequencing, finding um, an etiology for high drops in a large proportion of patients. Um, features that you find pediatric cancers when the um, child has Lynch syndrome, so reminding people to look for Lynch mismatch, mismatch repair variants when faced with pediatric cancers, and then uh, the utility of long read sequencing in neurodevelopmental disorders. So just a tiny uh, selection of the many impactful papers. Um, so. There really was, you know, a really important legacy, in my opinion, for CSER. Um, the, as I alluded to earlier, the incidental finding rate paper um, and the inconsistencies we found in variant um, informed the ACMG incidental finding list. So the CSER groups all had their own incidental finding lists. The incidental finding one used the UW list, which was like 110 genes, but different groups had different ones. And when ACMG went to make their consensus, they asked us for all of our lists. And now they had a narrower list because they wanted to have the highest impact genes at the time. And some of the genes that they ignored early, especially the recessives, have come back up. But I think the need for consensus on incidental findings and the list themselves, um, CSER made important contributions to. And similarly, I think we made important contributions to the variant classification and, the, and standardizing variant classification. Um, the other thing I said before is that in CSER 2, we targeted 60% diversity for each group, but when we actually looked at our definition of diversity, medically underserved, um, not just ancestral diversity, we had 75% diversity in those CSER 2 participants, which was fabulous. And CSER 2 really did include non-academic medical centers as important contributors. I'm going to turn it back over to Kyle, uh, but I did want to say that Zoe Bly and Lucia Hindorf not only helped with this presentation, but were <laughs> critical members of CSER. And so I, I want to personally give them my thanks uh, before I hand it back. So this um, shows some of Zoe's work. Um, this is a framework that Bruce Korf put together, and uh, the numbers represent uh, publications uh, related to those topics. You can see sort of getting uh, the testing done and then getting the results back into the hands of providers and, and patients and families. Um, we had several papers from CSER that were talking to basically about team science, uh, how uh, we did this work and what we think the lessons learned could be from this work, including a paper looking at uh, resilience during COVID by Stephanie Kraft. And um, I, I would recommend you take a look at these, um, uh, any, any uh, body participating in a new consortium, because I think there are some really great lessons learned here. Um, we, we wanted to sort of highlight um, the um, contribution that CSER made to sort of building the careers of genetic counselors. Um, 
we really from day one had uh, extraordinary genetic counselors in the consortium and uh, many of whom were working group chairs. And then you can see 49 publications with genetic counselors as first or last authors, 13% of all of uh, U grant papers. And I think really highlighting as uh, NHGRI has, has recognized very strongly in recent years that genetic counselors are really a wonderful source of uh, leaders within genomic medicine. And uh, Caesar's very proud of uh, its sort of folks who started out in the junior phase and are now kind of national leaders um, in, in their work. Um, similarly, uh, there was a focus from day one on junior trainees. Um, Caesar meetings often had a separate time uh, set aside for scientific presentations by junior folks. Um, with the intention of building the experience for these folks. And also work groups uh, often had uh, co-chairs, one a more senior person, one a more junior person, a as itself a kind of mentorship activity. And so you can see here, these are work group chairs who were junior. Again, uh, I'm on this list because at the time I was junior. Um, there are also folks that I know you will recognize are now uh, national leaders. and. Um, we, as again, we highlighted these folks throughout by showing their pictures, and there were 149 publications with junior investigators as first or last authors, 38% of all of the U grant papers. Okay, uh, we wanted to uh, just highlight our most highly cited um, papers. So these five uh, are from CSER 1, and um, you can see it across a number of uh, areas including in my OncoSeq paper from the University of Michigan, uh, a site-specific paper. So really interesting work there. For CSER phase two, uh, there's a little bit of a recency bias here because the projects that uh, came out towards the beginning of CSER two uh, have obviously accumulated a bit more references. I think there's really still excellent work going on. Okay, yeah, we just wanted to uh, close by summarizing what we think is sort of um, the legacy of CSER. Um, in moving from exploratory to evidence generating, uh, I really think a lot of what we see today about the practice of genomic medicine, uh, we think CSER uh, contributed to much of that. Uh, it was highly disciplinary and um, LC was embedded throughout. Uh, I'll also highlight that especially CSER phase two, highlighted uh, or incorporated folks that maybe at the beginning of Caesar II would not have said they were LC folks, folks who worked on uh, social issues, social justice, et cetera, uh, community engagement. And uh, many of those folks are now more integrated parts of uh, the genomics uh, community. But Caesar II really helped bring in basically some new folks into the fold. Um, a lot of attention to clinical, clinical workflow and um, working on thoughtful study design uh, as we've repeated over and over again, engaging diverse populations in clinical care settings, and then um, a, a lot of excellent work on team science and, and building the careers of junior investigators. So here's some just we think key evidence generated by CSER, rates of concordance and disconcordance and variant interpretation, uh, frequency of changes to clinical management, a, a, a nut we still continue to try to, to crack, but CSER has worked on that to some extent. Um, readiness of patients and parents to follow up on genomic re results. Uh, basically, uh, showed work by Jill Robinson that showed there's really little evidence of harm. Those things are quite rare. And uh, the need to adapt genomic medicine research to integrate diverse populations in diverse care settings. And uh, this is, as you know, a huge group of people involved in this work. I did uh, because uh, I'm not Gail. I can really highlight the folks that worked for Gail throughout all of this, the coordinating center, who really were an extraordinary group of people uh, who worked tirelessly to support this work. And, um, you know, they're, they're not here presenting, but really the, their uh, fingerprints on our, are on all of this work. Really excellent folks. And then, of course, we had great uh, collaborators from NHGRI and some of the other ICs across NIH who participated in CSER. So I wanted to recognize them as well. Thank you so much. All council members are thinking of slides and Nancy, we'll start with you. I just want to make one comment. I, I really enjoyed that walk down memory lane. I also thought the way Gail opened it in particular 
brought back flash, you know, sort of memories. You know, when we published the strategic vision in 2011 and put the phrase genomic medicine in the title, that was not universally embraced by the community. <laughs> we took some, oh, yeah. we took serious pushback. Too soon, too aggressive. What's this, this new director's, you know, loose cannon? Um, and, you know, I think Caesar, among others, just have sort of made us, you could look back and laugh about it now the same way we can laugh at the people who were opposed to the Human Genome Project at the time of the Human right. Genome Project. Is, but I just can remember, you're absolutely right, just, you don't have to go back to 2011. That's when the strategic vision came out. That's when the criticism started to ramp up. And we put out Caesar and we never looked back. No, the criticism started at the strategic planning meeting. <laughs> so that was fantastic. And I really, I really loved the, the overview and the flow from Caesar one to Caesar two. It was, it was very helpful. I have to ask, so you gave great examples of good things Caesar pioneered that made, made their way into lots of other guidelines and recommendations and, and activities that others were doing. For, for those of us, you know, thinking now about new consortia forming, were there dead ends? Were there things that you thought were gonna be important to do and that you spent time on that in hindsight were a distraction? I'm, I'm just like, were there lessons in the other direction, any that you could provide us with? Mm, that's a great question. Why, well, you know, I, and, and everyone knows I'm not usually the optimist in the room. I, I, I can't think of any. I mean, I think that even, you know, it was such a great group of people for discussion and reaching a consensus. And the in-person meetings for this consortium were so valuable. And I laugh with Ellen Clayton now that we used to disagree about everything then. And now we agree all the time. It's kind of frightening. Um, and so I think a lot of us you know, found a common ground. And I think having those LC people in the room always, and part of the science, and for several of our meetings, the LC people went first. Like that was like, <laughs> so we wanted to have time for them. We wanted to make Make sure and have time for them. Um, I, I think we learned a huge amount from each other. I'm sure there were things we were all wrong about, but there were plenty of people to tell us that. So. Yeah, uh, maybe not so much a dead end, but just sort of the uh, way I, I think Caesar's work outgrew a consortium. So um, we had different sites doing different kinds of activities, some folks working in pediatric cancer, others working in prenatal uh, testing, others in pediatric neurodevelopmental conditions. And I think um, we, I mean, there was a struggle over time to say, to get measures that sort of would work and trying to give a picture that was cohesive of all of these different areas. And I think that made a lot of sense at the time that Caesar was forming for phase one and phase two to do that. And I think, in part because of Caesar's work, we got to the point where it no longer made sense to do that because now we needed deep dives. It wasn't good enough to have these sort of 10,000 foot measures. We really need to, like we need a consortium just on pediatric cancer, or we need a consortium just on neurodevelopmental conditions, which as we've been discussing today, many of those things move outside of NHGRI at that point. So I remember the refrain over and over again that Caesar was not a variant discovery project, but how many variants did you discover? Um, so, you know, I, I'm sorry that we didn't put that together because we did, all, all the projects put a huge number of variants into ClinVar and all the variants from those variant consensus activities, those were some of the early entrants into ClinVar, the, the, um, the 6500, all those variants went in. So we were strong contributors and I still get queries about some of those variants because my name is now on them since Laura left. <laughs> And by the way, Nancy, since you were a mem uh, previously were a member of our Board of Scientific Counselors, I, I would also like to point out that the other thing that was very nice about Caesar was very welcoming to our intramural 
colleagues, um, and because our intramural program historically got out a little ahead on genomic medicine limitation long before extramural did. And to me, it was wonderful that when we created this extramural, they were very welcoming to Les B. Sucker's group and others, and um, to really bring, just like it brought Elsie into the fold, it also brought, it bridged the different parts of the institute together, which was very gratifying. And that, in some way, that's right. Or, yeah. Okay. Thank you both, Kyle and Gail, for that. 